Good afternoon, friends. I'm Cameron Patterson, Executive Director here at the Robert Rustin Moton Museum, a civil rights national historic landmark dedicated to preserving and constructively interpreting the history of civil rights in education, specifically as it relates to Prince Edward County and the leading role our citizens play in helping to move our country from segregation to integration. Additionally, we strive to promote dialogue and advance positions that ensure empowerment and a constitutional democracy. I'm excited to welcome you to our second episode of our Moton Mondays program for 2021. Once again, we are excited to bring back a program familiar to our Moton faithful with a new spin. Moton Mondays is a wonderful learning opportunity for you, our viewers, as we explore different topics that connect to our work here at Moton and additionally explore different themes related to civil rights, education, and other topics. We are building a dynamic lineup of speakers. And again, you can join us on the second Monday of each month. I'm excited for today's program. We are joined by Elvatrice Parker Belchase, a public historian, researcher, and filmmaker who specializes in chronicling the Black experience in history. She is the author of the pictorial publication, Black America series, Richmond, Virginia, and has several documentaries in development. El Latrice will take the audience today on a journey into civil rights and education through the memories of her late parents who were gifted educators. Her father, Ernest Parker Sr., taught mathematics here at Robert R. Moton High School from 1951 to 1955, where he also served as an assistant football coach and athletic director. While serving as Barbara John's homeroom algebra teacher, he discovered students making placards in the back of the class in preparation for the 1951 walkout. We are so excited to hear from Elva Trees, and I'm excited to turn the program over to her. Thank you so much, Mr. Patterson, for having me. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on our journey today, we're going to take a look at some of the major organizations uh, that paved the road to Brown, as well as some landmark cases and people involved uh, before we even get to the Moton story. Uh, a little bit about uh, the personal story from the time that I can just remember my dad drilled into us that powerful story of the walkout. You know, I didn't understand what it meant as a child, but slowly but surely, uh, the the enormity of the uh, process became very apparent. So we're going to take a look through the eyes partially of uh, my parents' journey because they found themselves actually at the precipice of civil rights and history not once but twice. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to do that may be a little bit different is I'm going to talk about some organizations that were critical in paving the road to Brown, if you will. Number one was the Virginia State Teachers Association, alternatively known as the Virginia Teachers Association. Audience, I can tell you that by far, this organization was the most powerful civil rights organization, at least of the first 30 years of the 20th century. And we will see how they forged a special relationship with the NAACP to start the cases that will take us to the road of Brown, road to Brown, if you will. Number two, another major organization you may or may not have heard about is the Negro Organization. It actually was the successor to the Hampton, uh, the Hampton Conferences. And R.R. Uh, Moton was a major uh, operator in this regard. The, the NOS 
was primarily a, an umbrella institution. So it actually encompassed the Virginia State Teachers Association and many other black associations. It had four components as its motto or mission, if you will, better homes, better schools, uh, also better, uh, better schools and better health. So those are just three of those and better farms. Next, we have to speak about the NAACP because they were critical, but we're gonna see that early on that Virginia State Teachers Association financed those landmark cases uh, that included the NAACP. All right, I wanna start out with Dr. James Hugo Johnston Sr. Uh, Johnston was born enslaved in Richmond but he actually, by 1887, he was head of the Peabody Reading Circle, an audience that was actually the forerunner of the Virginia State Teachers Association. They met in Lynchburg and some of the other names you might recognize are uh, Daniel Barclay Williams and Mrs. Rosa Dixon Bowser, but they had as their mission uplift and the need for continuing education for teachers. And as such, Dr. Johnston also served as the second president of what is now Virginia State University. But again, we, we started out with the Peabody Reading Circle in 18, 1887, and that evolved into the Virginia State Teachers Association. Again, this was the most powerful um, association in the state as it relates to Blacks. And there's a reason why in terms of numbers, sheer numbers. If we look at the numbers from 1937, where they, and that was the year, by the way, they celebrated their 50th anniversary, out of 4,000 black teachers across the state, 3,700 of them were members of the Virginia State Teachers Association. All right, so having said that, they wielded the power and they had brilliant, brilliant leaders and members. And those are some of the folks that we will take a look at pretty soon. All right, Professor Charles Hamilton Houston Sr. We can't, we're going to cut back to the Virginia State Teachers Association, but we have to honor a brilliant professor and a man who is truly or was truly the architect for the uh, for how Brown versus Board came about, or I should say the dismantling of that separate, separate but equal doctrine that was really uh, set forth with the Plessy versus, Sir, uh, I'm sorry, Plessis, Plessy versus Ferguson case uh, decided by the Supreme Court in 1896. Uh, Hamilton was a second generation lawyer. Uh, he ended up going to Amherst College uh, first and he received his law degree from Harvard University in uh, 1922, I believe, and then uh, attained his doctorate in what is known as law or juridical uh, science in 1923. He was also said to be one of the first, if not the first black person to become one of the editors of the prestigious Harvard Law Review. Dr. Uh, Professor Houston, decided early on that he wanted to make it his mission to dismantle uh, that separate but equal doctrine, again, uh, set forth by that Supreme Court decision in 1896 with the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. So when he was called to become Dean of the Howard University College of Law, or School of Law, I'm sorry, he knew that he needed to raise up a cadre of individuals who could dismantle uh, the infrastructure that was cemented, if you will, by that uh, Plessy versus Ferguson case. Uh, not everyone was happy, audience, when he transformed Howard University School of Law from a part-time evening school into a full-time, uh, full-bodied university law school but he knew that it was necessary in order, again, to raise up those men and women who could dismantle that separate but equal doctrine. And so by and large, many of these 
extraordinarily brilliant civil rights lawyers were protégés of Dr. Houston and people like uh, Professor Leon Ransom and uh, Nabred and others. And so we will take a look at those because quite frankly, audience, you cannot talk about the civil rights movement and the dismantling of that separate but equal doctrine without talking about the role of Howard University's School of Law and its graduates. All right, now I said that we were gonna address again, education and those educational organizations and their contributions to uh, the road to Brown, if you will, or paving the way to Brown. Where we start, uh, audience, is with those teachers' equalization and paid suits, because they clearly paid to pave uh, the road to Brown. So let's take a look at a, a just one of the plaintiffs. Uh, people like Thurgood Marshall, Oliver Hill, and uh, J. Thomas Hewen, and others, um, Spotswood Robinson, began to uh, file these equalization cases all around uh, the state of Virginia. And uh, I know that there was at least one in Surrey, uh, New Kent, but the one that we're, look, that we're gonna address, address right now is the one in Norfolk. Mrs. Aileen Black uh, consented to become the test case. In looking at the numbers audience, when you look at the numbers in terms of what the salaries were for female white teachers in high school versus black female teachers or lady teachers, I mean, the differences were very stark and even starker for black high school men who were high school teachers in Norfolk and white high school uh, men who were teachers in Norfolk. And so once again, with these equalization, and, and I, I want to emphasize that um, Professor Houston also dived in and played an active role in these, at least this one, along with others, and Thurgood Marshall and others, and also Oliver Hill. But when they took on the Norfolk case, as we said before, Miss Aileen Black here was a chemistry teacher at the uh, all black Booker T. Washington High School in Norfolk. And this is where my parents come in because my father and mom drilled that story into my head or our heads also because they were taught, they were actually there at the time that these uh, suits uh, were brought. And so Mrs. Aileen Black was a, a graduate of uh, Virginia, what is now Virginia State University. She had uh, earned a master's in, from the University of Pennsylvania and it would start to do work on her doctorate but she agreed to be that test case. Now, this is what the uh, this is what Norfolk did to her. They did not renew her contract, and you will find that this was a very common thing uh, that occurred to people who decided to voice uh, their opinions about these inequities. And so, since she lost her position uh, in court, they said, well, she had no right to bring forth the case because she was no longer an educator there. But that did not thwart the efforts of Thurgood Marshall and the others because they knew that in order for it to become a precedent setting case, they wanted it to go higher, okay? So having said that, next we uh, move on because she was you know, moved out of her position. Uh, the next person that would step up to the plate was Melvin Austin. He was uh, of Norfolk. Again, uh, Booker T. Washington was the lone public high school for blacks in Norfolk, Virginia. Now, Melvin Austin did the same thing. I believe he was pe uh, president of the Norfolk Teachers Association. He stepped up to the plate. Again, the case would meander through the courts, but finally the Supreme Court, you know, made clear that those salaries needed to be equalized. So at that point, it became a precedent setting case. So you can start to see the road to Brown was really paved in large part by those teachers, e uh, equalization of teachers' suits, if you will, and particularly the uh, infrastructure and machinery was uh, in place because of Professor Charles Hamilton Houston and his protégés. By the way, I want to, I do want to add that Ms. Black was uh, 
uh, rehired in about a couple of years or so back to her position. But again, you know, my parents were at the precipice of this civil rights and education because they were taught by both Mr. Austin and Ms. Black. All right, now we're getting to when my father arrived here. This is a this is from the yearbook, courtesy of William Cosby, whose mother was Mrs. Hilda Johnson Cosby there. This is my dad in back, uh, Ernest Parker Sr. He loved mathematics. Anyone who was a student can tell you that. But I also have another relative on this photograph. Mrs. Helen Garant also taught mathematics. And she and my mom were best friends and they married brothers. And so they were, again, all of the, what I can say is this, those faculty, not just here, but elsewhere, poured into those kids because they knew that those kids needed to be twice as good as their counterparts anywhere in the world. And that's how they, uh, that's, that was their experiences uh, also their experiences. Uh, to give you an example, when my father was at Booker T. Washington, he had a, a math teacher by the name of Jimmy Johnson. If he gave you a hundred word problems and you did 95, he would chew you out. Uh, again, he, Mr. Johnson taught calculus. And when, as my father told me, when Harvard University would come to town to administer those admissions tests, the Booker T. Washington students would score very highly and the powers that be didn't like that. And so they told Mr. Johnson to stop teaching calculus. He refused and he lost his position. So as we talk about uh, Jim Crow and segregation and the torn books, we need to talk and the decrepit sometimes buildings, always be mindful of those administrators and those teachers who knew that their charges needed to be twice as good as any kids anywhere in the world. And I, I bring that up also because my parents uh, carried those things into their careers and I did in my career as an educator. All right, now we get to see something up close and personal here. This is my father's contract uh, for his first teaching job out of college at R.R. Moton. If I can skip down here, you will see that he signed on to make a whopping $11.11 an hour. That's right, $11.11 an hour. And later on, after my parents uh, became married, two little kids in tow, they actually lived above Mr. Ed, Ed Allen's funeral home, actually for about $40 a month. So it's a very personal story. All right, and here uh, we have my father here, and I do believe that's Joan John Cobbs there, and I look to ID the rest of these wonderful folks also. But again, my dad poured into his students like his teachers did uh, before him. He started taking kids around to these math and science conferences around the state. Now the Virginia Conference of Math and Science Teachers of which he was a member conducted these uh, science competitions. And so Moton students did extremely well. He wasn't the only teacher who had winners. Uh, all of these teachers were winners. But you know, from, from his experiences, he was very competitive and he wanted to instill that in his students. And so People, some of these students earned scholarships. Some went on to prestigious uh, prep schools and uh, you know, the sky was the limit. And so again, and I'm gonna show you something that I pulled just this morning that I knew about. And that is uh, one newspaper account of Joan Johns, now Joan Johns Carp and Ed Wilda, Ed Wilda Allen back in, uh, 1953, they attended one of these math and science conferences and they placed, this conference was at Virginia uh, Union University in Richmond, but they were able to see a lot of different places and they weren't the only, only winners because you will see on here also that uh, Joy Cabarrus, I mean, Joy Cabarrus speaks at one 
and Thelma Allen had won in the last last year. Sponsors again, Ernest Parker, Mrs. White, Mrs. Helen Parker, and Ms. Glaze. And so again, you know, they wanted to instill that com um, competitive edge in their students, and the students were extremely well prepared. All right, now we are moving into why uh, Barbara Johns and uh, her cohort led the strike. When it comes to the conditions that were uh, evident in the 1950s, this picture bears that out. Now, my father taught both inside and in one of the tar paper shacks. Okay? They were formerly known as temporary buildings, but there were three tar paper shacks. And so I grew up hearing that story and could, and from the from the day I was probably, it seems like born until he could not speak anymore, about the, the stories about the shacks. With these stoves here, you burned almost what seemed like to death if you were close to them, and you were very cold if you were away from them in the tar paper shacks. But moreover, for a kid, what stuck with me was the fact that he said when it rained, the kids had to actually open their umbrellas uh, on the inside of the classroom. And I would learn later that, you know, even though the school was built for 150 or so students, it was bursting at the seams with 450 plus by the 1950s. People, yes, lobbied for years, principals, teachers, PTA members, they, well, they simply lobbied for years for a new building and they were told it was coming, it was coming. But, you know, in traveling around, these kids saw what things were like at other schools, both black and white. And they knew that they needed to do something about that. This, by the way, this particular uh, photograph comes from the National Archives. A lot of the uh, photographs that were utilized by the plaintiffs and defendants are at the National Archives. And so you're looking at actually one of the internal shacks. I believe specifically this was an English class for ninth graders. All right, and this comes from my father's collection. You can clearly see the tar paper shacks there, one of them to the right, and it looks like one to the left. There were three. And again, uh, things were pretty deplorable. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that when my father got here, he mentioned that, you know, cause he taught, uh, he had a homeroom class and an algebra class. He noticed that some of the uh, female students would break out in tears and he didn't know why. He thought he asked, was it something that he said? And that is when he told them about the bus accident where first of all, they were given hand-me-down buses. And as I understand it, one of them stalled on tracks and several students were killed. And so, you know, he came here and realized, you know, along with them that some type of change needed to occur because these, these kids were already traumatized, but that they did not, they weren't deterred by what had occurred. All right, here is a good place, audience, to bring in some of those brilliant scholars that helped, in, scholars that were uh, in large part protégés of Professor Charles Hamilton Houston, as well as a couple of educational education scholars, if you will. I'm going to start from the right. Uh, on the very right here, we have uh, attorney Spotswood W. Robinson III, a brilliant, brilliant uh, attorney. Now he was, of course, born in Richmond. His, he was a second generation lawyer. His father dealt in, for the most part, business law. But this is a profound quote that I found uh, in regards to Spot, Spotswood Robinson. He said that when he entered the, the uh, Howard University School of Law, he said, quote, my life changed at the moment I entered that place. And so one of the things that he said additionally was that 
Professor Charles Hamilton Houston drilled into them, this law degree is not just for you. It's for everyone, so make good use of it. Okay? In other words, you've got to go out and help your community. And they did. Now, another personal story, uh, Judge Robinson was a neighbor of ours. He lived within three blocks of us. So my father really drilled that story home. Uh, he was so brilliant audience that his grade point average wasn't even, uh, he had the highest grade, or I should say he earned the highest grade point average in the history of Howard University's uh, School of Law as far as them being recorded, if you will. And I don't think it was uh, passed until probably recent years. He would go on to become a judge uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and then he was elevated to the uh, chief judge eventually for the U.S. District Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. And I might add, one of his associate justices was none other than uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So again, such a brilliant, brilliant man. And what we will see is when he came to Davis versus Prince Edward County, and also when he came to uh, arguing before the United States Court, he took on the constitutionality or, or not, uh, uh, th and that it was not really fair and that it was unconstitutional. So he took on that argument. And uh, what you will find is that many of the landmark civil rights cases uh, are founded, if you will, I should say the remedies are predicated on the uh, equal protection of laws on section one of uh, the 14th amendment whether it's loving, whether it's same-sex marriage and the myriad um, civil rights cases, that 14th really stands tall. So we have again, Spotswood Robinson III, he was in partnership with Thurgood Marshall and Oliver Hill and others as NAACP legal, uh, legal counselors, if you will. So they filed probably hundreds of cases throughout the South. Uh, next to him is Dr. Thomas Henderson. Henderson was president of Virginia Union University from about 1960 until 1970. And he was also a uh, educational scholar and he was vital. You said this particular case on the road to Brown utilized a brilliant uh, interdisciplinary teams. You, you've heard of the Clarks with the doll test. You had sociologists, you had educational scholars and so they attacked this thing on all fronts, audience. Next, we have Dr. J. Rupert Pikett, again, a brilliant man who was executive secretary of that Virginia State Teachers Association. So again, they were armed with powerful statistics as showing how it was separate and it was unequal. But even though, you know, we, we still had to dismantle, if you will, that, um, Plessy versus Ferguson case that just nailed it for almost 50 years. Next, we have Oliver Hill, who also lived in the north side of Richmond, Virginia, another brilliant lawyer. And I'll tell you something inch, both funny and interesting. Um, when I was wrapping up my book uh, 20 years ago this summer, I went to Oliver Hill's home to interview him. And uh, he mentioned, because both he and Thurgood Marshall were in the class of 1933 under Professor Houston. He said that, you know, because I was an Omega, as an Omega sci-fi and Mr. Marshall was an alpha, you know, we ran things. Nothing came through the school without coming through us first. I thought that was pretty interesting. And he also participated early on in those equalization cases that we talked about that were initiated in around 1938. So you can really clearly see the road to Brown again. With this road to Brown again, you have the architect, Charles Hamilton Houston, and you're looking at some of his brilliant protégés. And so they worked their way through at first with him as a colleague. And then they journeyed on their own case after case and we finally get to the big ones that we all know about. Something I think uh, was, 
I asked him a question that I think uh, he provided a very profound answer to audience. And I'll mention this quickly now. In sitting in his living room, you know, he had quite a few awards that surrounded him. And he was sightless at the, at, by this time, this was 2001. Uh, I asked him in looking at the Presidential Medal of Freedom that he uh, was awarded under President Clinton. I asked him if he was nervous at all in being presented that at the White House. He said, no. And then I asked him a, a question that really speaks volumes in terms of his answer. I said, of all of these awards, Mr. Hill, which one means the most to you? And he thought for a minute. He said, I suppose that Charles Hamilton Houston Award, that says it all right there. All right, then we finally get to Miss Barbara Rose Johns, later Powell. You know, instead of just uh, lamenting the deplorable con conditions, uh, Miss Johns decided to do something about it. She enlisted the help of some seniors and some other students that sh she could trust. And, you know, part of it perhaps was driven by the fact that when she confided in her teacher, music teacher, Mrs. Inez Davenport, Mrs. Davenport replied, you know, when she said, you know, it's just, these things just aren't fair. I mean, you had people, it, the school was so packed, people were, they were having classes on the buses, actually in the auditoriums, maybe three classes at a time, in addition to the tar paper shucks. And so when she confided in Mrs. Uh, Davenport, Mrs. Davenport replied, why don't you do something about it? And, you know, she thought about it for a while. And then slowly but surely, they started to exchange notes in a secretive way. And so Mrs. Inez Davenport Jones was actually Barbara Jones, what we call um, ram in the bush. And that meant she, she was really divinely inspired and she was divinely directed to someone who was willing to risk it all to guide her in a very quiet manner. And so that walkout ensued, you know, after months of preparation and planning, uh, on April 23rd, 1951. And of course, it will become, as we will see, one of the five cases uh, decided under Brown v. Board. But I wanted to show you another personal and rare piece of memorabilia. And that comes from my father's collection, which is now my collection. And I don't know if many people have seen this, but actually, audience, this is a document that uh, the, sent to the parents asking them to send their children back to school. Okay, and here you can see Mr. M. Boyd Jones's uh, autograph. I can see my dad's Ernest Parker, Miss Hilda Johnson, who's now uh, with Lake Hilda Johnson Cosby. Uh, I can see my aunt Helen Garant, Thomas Mayfield, Mrs. Perval. Uh, everyone signed it, and you know there was tremendous pressure from you know the superintendent McElwain and the others, you know, to get those kids back into school. All right, I pulled this one for the National Archives because I wanted everyone to see audience just one of the pages that delineates some of the plaintiffs from the from the Dave's versus, versus, I'm sorry, County School Board of uh, Prince Edward County. And this particular page does have uh, some of the Allens. There's Barbara Rose Johns and Joan Marie Johns, infants by Robert Johns. So you will see oftentimes the plaintiffs and their parents here. All right, now with the cases, what were those five cases under Brown? Well, here we are, and we'll go through these quickly. Uh, they came from five different areas. DC's was Bowling versus Sharp, Delaware, Belton versus Gebhardt, and you'll see Beulah versus Gebhardt. Well, what was that all about? All about? Why do we have two people? Glad you asked. One involved challenging uh, uh, this one room school that had the issue. The other was a high school. Gephardt was the surname for Frances Gephardt, who was a member of the State Board of Education. Okay, So she was named precisely in this regard. 
course, Virginia, Virginia's entry was Davis versus, versus County School Board of Prince Edward County. South Carolina's uh, case was Briggs versus Elliott. Kansas, of course, was the namesake, Brown versus the Board of Education. Why were all of these lumped together? Because they had the same issue, was separate but equal constitutional. And so the United States Supreme Court decided to hear these five collectively. Okay. Now, on that fateful day, March, I'm sorry, May 17th, uh, 1954, the ruling came down. And I'm sure a lot of people remember where they were when it came down, but it, it was a unanimous court based on that 14th Amendment, Section 1, where the clause mentions equal protection uh, of the laws. Now, I'll give you a little caveat here. Since the District of Columbia is not a state, what Warren did was rule based on the Fifth Amendment under due process, but they were all uh, uh, this was all this this all came down the same day and it was a unanimous decision all right i wanted to show this uh, it's special i think because mrs inez davenport jones the wife of principal m boy jones was silent about her contributions for decades and it really you know tore away at her but what she did was profound and Thanks be to God, she is still with us today. And so if you can see here, and this comes from the Richmond Times-Dispatch uh, 1999 article, she talks about nearly 50 years of, of silence. But again, they traded those notes and surely she could have gotten into major trouble, but she didn't. Uh, she did say later on that she told her husband after the second night, you know, her role in those, in the, in the, uh, the situation, but he never wavered in his backing of those students. But because they thought that he may have had something to do with it, audience, he was relieved of his job. You know, they will say, well, he wasn't fired. His contract wasn't renewed. Renewed. Well, that's what they did back then, you see. So again, a salute to Ms. Uh, Dr. and Mrs. N. Boyd Jones because of their powerful roles also. All right, and I think we're near the end here on my part, but I wanted to mention just the landmark cases because I I feel that we'll probably get some questions or I didn't want to leave this out. Brown versus Board, you know, this decision was rendered in 1954, but that wasn't the end of it, audience, because the court left out some necessary directions. So people simply dragged their feet and they had to go before the Supreme Court again in what is known as Brown v. Board II in 1955. And that's where you get the all deliberate speed um, phrase, if you will. In other, in other words, you know, you need to move this along by any means necessary. And so you start to see all of these massive resistance tactics, massive resistance tactics and you know, pupil placement boards and all, things like that. Again. In 1959, a really rough thing occurred in that the schools were shut down. And for five, about almost five years, 59 to 64, but um, Reverend L. L. Francis Griffin, on behalf of his son, uh, again, mounted a, a case that was heard before the Supreme Court. And, you know, that stopped that, uh, that situation, if you will. But you know, it was a, a lost generation there for a point there. Imagine, I've, ta I've talked to people who were farmed out all over the country, people that were taken in uh, within days by Quaker families in other states. And you know, there are some who never made it back to school. So those were really turbulent times. All right, now I am going to stop here because I don't want to run out of time, but I wanted to just provide an overview as to how we can look at perhaps how the road to Brown was paved by, again, uh, the Virginia State Teachers Association with those equalization and pay suits, along with uh, the architect, Professor Charles Hamilton Houston, and our brilliant attorneys, and those parents and students like Barbara Johns and all of those who played a role. Uh, the scholars, so there, you know, there is a road to Brown, and hopefully, uh, 
this stimulates some type of interest uh, in you know the the powerful efforts and uh, uh, community that really set this in motion. And I thank you. Elva, uh, we are thankful for what you've shared today. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have trickled in. And the first question is, um, how does it feel for you to tell this story from your parents' perspective uh, based on what they have shared with you through the years and what you have come across in terms of what they have left for you. Thank you, Cameron. It's, to me, it's a blessing and an honor to be able to tell the story. You know, oftentimes uh, when I present, uh, parents in the audience ask, well, oh, they'll say, I didn't get this in school. And, um, you know, a lot of these things I didn't get in school either, but my parents infused these stories into us so much so that it is marrow deep, DNA deep. And as such, we have to tell our stories. You know, I don't care if you tell a kid the story a thousand times, we must tell our stories and we must have vehicles to showcase those stories with, you know, with the, the cultural sensitivity. And I can tell you, Cameron, a lot of the half still hasn't been told. There are even more stories out there that are more profound, uh, uh, just as profound as anything you've heard just far. I mean, I, you know, we hear about these things every day. So to me, it is a signal honor. And, you know, I too am, the, am, am an educator, whether I'm talking about you know, how the body works or how medications work or history, it's all relative. My calling is as an educator. So, you know, I would tell people to follow your calling because oftentimes that is your purpose, you see. And I would like to, before I go any further, uh, leave us with a charge. Now this charge comes from the class motto for the 1896 graduating class of Hampton Institute, my, al uh, my alma mater, the ch their motto was find a way or make one. Find a way or make one. That charge doesn't leave any room for excuses, but let's look at that little trip that we just took and uh, see how that was interwoven into that. When Charles Hamilton Houston wanted to raise a, up a cadre of men and women who could dismantle that separate but equal doctrine. What did he do? When he became dean, he took the Howard University School of Law to another level so that he could raise those men and women who could do it. What did he do? He found a way and he made one. If you look at uh, Barbara Johns and Mrs. Agnes D Davenport and all of those who were associated with the walkout here, instead of simply lamenting the deplorable conditions, what did they do? They found a way and they made one. You know, the walkout became ultimately one of the five cases founded under Brown v. Board. After that, the, home, the gentleman that was the homeroom teacher, an algebra teacher for Barbara Johns, uh, left our, our Milton with a wife and two kids in tow to Henrico and it left and migrated to Henrico County, Virginia, because his uh, reappointment was late in coming. Even though this fellow was given five math classes, which was a full load, he instituted a sixth class and started teaching calculus voluntarily. Why? Because he knew that those kids needed calculus to be as competitive as their counterparts anywhere in the world. This instructor also uh, led study sessions into the night for his math students. And then he drove them home all around the county, so much so and the, his floorboard wore out and you can actually see, you could see the highway under or through his floorboard. What did he do? He found a way and he made one. And that man was my father. 
And so when we talk about simply, you know, putting up with things or simply lamenting things as they were or are, we need to roll up our sleeves and do just what those people did, uh, find a way and make and uh, make one. And then all that we do, we must and should endeavor to always honor uh, the brotherhood of man as they did in the fatherhood of God. So that's my take on that. I know it's a pretty long answer. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, my next question for you, just in thinking about your parents, um, you know, what, how did this experience uh, impact the remaining remainder of their educational career? Great question. For their entire careers, Cameron, they taught the same way. They poured into their students like their teachers poured into them during Jim Crow, Miss Aileen Black and, you know, Melvin Austin and Jimmy Johnson. So, you know, we hear about that phrase, no child left behind. That's not new. People, those teachers taught like that, like their lives depended on it for, for decades. And so, yes, it to this day, you know, I've, I joined the faculty at Hampton University at 24 years old, and I brought with me that same essence and duty and calling for, you know, for my students. You know, I've taught at other places too, but you bring that with you as though it is in your DNA because it is a calling and it's something that you have to do. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, looking at the questions as they pour in. Uh, my next question is, where would someone go to get information or resources about the Virginia teacher organizations that you referenced in your presentation? Um, what's typically some of your go-to um, resources? Yes, that is an easy one. Thank you for asking that. The records of the Virginia State Teachers Association, also known as VTA, are at Virginia State University uh, spe under special collections. And so, you know, I've poured through decades of those, uh, you know, in tracing these people. And so it is a powerful story. You know, there have been theses and documents, uh, uh, should say, uh, uh, dissertations done on them. But I mean, these men and women were second to none. You know, I've, that, it wasn't just Norfolk as we we you know were shown with Aileen Black in Richmond. Oliver Hill led the uh, charge, and where Mrs. Antoinette Bowler was the test case. But the Richmond School Board came around before it had to go, but so far. And so again, yeah, the records for the official records for the Virginia State Teachers Association are at are in special collections at Virginia State University. Excellent. I, uh, Virginia State, I feel like they are the deans of the uh, record collection as it relates to the civil rights movement in Virginia. Yes, uh, because the free school, the free school, free school papers, papers are there. Too. Oliver yes. Hill's uh, papers, mm -hmm. uh, a great resource um, that they offer. And, uh, you know, it's our hope as a museum that we can. Uh, provide as it relates to Prince Edward, what they have provided uh, to the Commonwealth as well. So yes. thanks for sharing that. Yes. Um, so you kind of talked about your father uh, and you know his contract situation being in limbo, which really uh, kind of forced him to seek other opportunities uh, within Henrico County um, was that something that he talked about? Uh, did you hear that as a topic of conversation amongst other family members that were educators? I know you have quite a few family members that taught within the Prince Edward County system itself. Um, you know, we're, we're often seeing that teachers sacrificed in that way. Um, during this time. Right. Um, uh, like I said earlier, my this experience uh, was marrow deep as it relates to my father. And although he was here just four years, the ties continued until he passed. 
And so, you know, I, whenever he was hospitalized, I don't know how they knew it, but I would see uh, the Allen sisters come up and he would stop through at First Baptist on the way to, um, I think, homecoming at a Meharan Lutheran Church, uh, not far from here. And so I got to know them and, and I feel to this day, they are like extended family. You know, I talked to Mrs. Joan John, Johns Cobb just last night because I wanted her to know that, you know, I would lift her up and I would be doing this today. So the connections, you know, when I would bring him back, he would introduce me to these people. So I knew Mr. Mayfield and, you know, I was introduced to, you know, Mr. M. Boyd Jones. And so it was a lifelong, um, it really was a lifelong commitment for my parents as it relates to, to their students, Cameron, because and I'm the same way. Once you are, or once you are my student, you're always my student. And for my parents, once you were there, a student of theirs, you were always a student of theirs. I don't care if you were 80 and they were 85. They were they, they uh, took delight and joy in whatever you did. And so that's the only way I know. And that's that is exactly how they were. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my colleague Leah, she was like, she texted me. She said, "I want to hear more Oliver Hill stories." Uh, she's a big fan of um, Oliver Hill um, and his work. Um, you know what? Did you I, ever guys have conversations with him about the work he did in Prince Edward? And yeah, know, what when I interviewed him did. in the summer of two thousand and one. We did talk about that because I wanted to know exactly, you know, who called and, you know, the, the ins and outs of all, and, and all of that kind of thing. But the, to me, the best source for that now is his book, The Big Bang, because uh, I got him to autograph it personally for me 20 years ago when I interviewed him at his home, even though he had lost his sight, you know, due to a stroke. And that, that that's a treasure to me. It, his personally autographed copy of that. And so again, when you're telling something from your perspective, it's going to be very different than what someone else may conjure up as to what you were thinking. And so, you know, things like that. Oh, and I'll tell you one of the most and the, one of the greatest resources, the history makers. Uh, he, along with, uh, I think Spotswood Robinson was also interviewed. Uh, the history makers interviewed him personally and you can find that online and you can subscribe to it. But here you're getting these first person narratives once again. And so I was first introduced personally to the history makers when I was working towards um, a graduate certificate in public history at the University of Virginia. And uh, uh, Mrs. Juliana Richardson came down, the founder of the history makers, and uh, spoke to us, a group of us. And... Um, Actually, we were we had subscriptions to that particular very special body of work. I think they may have done thousands of oral history interviews by now, but those are uh, just second to none. And you can listen to short snippets for free without the subscription online now by simply going to the history makers. But those are powerful because he is speaking for himself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I. Um... You know, we could spend uh, countless time talking and hearing your stories. And, you know, I think for um, all of the knowledge that you've brought today, uh, as it relates to Prince Edward, as it relates to the school desegregation movement in Virginia, uh, you equally have uh, that knowledge as it relates to uh, the Black experience uh, in our state's capital of Richmond. Um, you know, just as we close, kind of talk about some of the forthcoming documentary work uh, that you will be working on. I know you've uh, recently received support from Virginia Humanities um, to move forward with that. So just uh, kind of close us out with with some of the projects that you're working on. Okay, well, as usual, <laughs> I'm working on uh, multiple projects. Uh, some of them started 20 years ago. I, you know, I remember when uh, we brought the last of the, I call it the moat memorabilia down from the attic. 
and uh, I still have those really faded, uh, tattered um, articles that dad saved regarding the case, even the one with the photograph of the burning cross. Um, that is one that I plan to do something on. I, uh, people have done myriad things on it. That doesn't sway me in any way because there's a different story to tell that hasn't been told. So that's one of them. I promised my dad, I said, dad, we, we've got to do something about this. It was also 20 years ago, I said, well, dad, we're going to do something about this. When I say that, I mean, I'm a, a piece, a, it's a documentary because I feel like it's the most powerful medium. And it may not be a documentary. It may be something on a, a lifetime, who knows? But at any rate, these stories are just so powerful. They serve to inspire so many. Um, when people, you look at people who were born within the wake of freedom and people who were sons and daughters of formerly enslaved people could go on to, you know, become leaders. It's amazing. Now, I failed to mention that, you know, Dr. N. Boy Jones, who was principal, by the way, was the son of a formerly enslaved man. His father was almost grown when slavery ended. And in one generation, you have a son that earns a PhD and becomes a noted professor at Norfolk State University, you know, after these, after this, this time period passed. And so there are just so many stories to be told. So the, yes, I was awarded a grant to develop the um, um, script for my Virginia Randolph um, documentary. And a, a very pleased, a very uh, blessed and honored and appreciative of that. And, I also have something in uh, in the works, and it's been for several years, um, regarding the Leonard Medical Graduates of Shaw University. Shaw University had at one point a law school, a pharmacy school, and uh, a medical school. And you can't talk about the Black hospital movement without talking about these gentlemen. Every, virtually every Black hospital in Virginia had at least one Leonard man who was a founder of it. And so, you know, some of these are passion projects and um you know you work on them some at a time being a researcher i don't means i don't have to hire other people to do that aspect but you know i hire people to film and shoot so i started filming sometimes oh, 20 years ago 15 years ago and so that even today i have those things and uh so when you know the time comes these things will be entered in i'll tell you a quick story I and mean, I brought uh, my dad back for the uh, 50th anniversary. What is it? 2001. I decided I'd already decided that I was going to do we were going to do something about it. So I rented a video camera for about 200 bucks for two days. And uh, uh, what do you call it? A, a tripod. So here I am amongst these huge cameras from CNN and MSNBC and NBC. Here I was with my little $200 camera. The tripod was almost leaning like the Tower of Pizza. But these people, you know, had cameras worth fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. Even the tripods were $15,000 tripods. But I meant, you know, with God backing me, I can get that story and get get things that you, you may not ever see. And so, you know, smite not the day of small beginnings get those interviews. I would implore everyone to do that because as people transition, you lose those stories. So that may be a long way around to your question, but that that's, oh, I, appreciate uh, it. I operate with, you know, prayer first and then I go to work. Appreciate it. And, you know, I just love your story because you are not, you kind of came into this work of being a historian, and, you know, a researcher. Am I correct that you're What's your what What's your field of work? Right, it was yeah. Now I'm a full time you know freelancer. My you know archival researcher, hit public historian, but my BA and MA are in biology. Uh, so I taught you know joined the faculty at Hampton, 24 years old, taught nursing majors and that kind of thing. Then I uh, matriculated at the Medical College of Virginia and I earned a uh, pharmacy degree. So I was a hospital and hospital and long term care pharmacist for years. But uh, July the 11th, 1999, I resigned my position because I received that calling to tell our stories through documentaries and publications. Now, yes, I've worked part time since then and close to full time. But I knew then that was my mission and it still is. Perfect. Well, I think that's a great way to end. We are uh, grateful that you are 
continuing to follow uh, your mission. Uh, we appreciate your insights today. Um, and, you know, we just want to thank you for participating in our set, second Moten Mondays uh, episode of 2021. Uh, we ask everyone that's still viewing with us to join us for the second Monday in March as we welcome Dr. Glenn Eskew, Professor of History at Georgia State University and Director of the World Heritage Initiative and Ann Pharisee, Project Manager with the Georgia State University World Heritage Initiative. They will share about an exciting project that the museum, Moton Museum, has been involved with, along with a number of other US civil rights sites across the South, as we work to submit a serial nomination uh, for World Heritage designation. So we're excited to share that with you. Uh, we're excited to share why we believe that you cannot tell the story of the modern civil rights movement without talking about what happens here in Prince Edward County, Virginia. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, Moton Mondays, we're signing off. Thank you. <laughs>